Today's special 10th anniversary episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast. It has been 10 years. Well, it's brought to you by SeatGeek, as always, our presenting sponsor. Not for all 10 years, but I wish. I wish it had been 10 years. They are the best place to find tickets for hockey, basketball, baseball, Hamilton, the opera, whatever you want. I have SeatGeek on my phone. The easiest way to shop for the best tickets, thanks to the revolutionary grading system, you can do everything on your phone in just two taps. Everything fully guaranteed. Try it out. Download the SeatGeek app today. Go right to SeatGeek.com. We are also brought to you by another one of our buddies. This is your buddy for Mother's Day, Books.com. Sending flowers is the best way to show someone you care. It's not always easy or satisfying. Books.com, changing that with fully transparent pricing, an easy shopping experience, great customer service, and an incredible selection starting at $40. Show every mom in your life that you care with flowers from the Books Company. Just visit books.com, B-O-U-Q-S.com. Enter code Bill for 20% off your Mother's Day purchase. Flowers will sell out, so don't wait. And finally, we are brought to you by Against All Odds with Cousin Sal. That's our new gambling podcast. Some winners were doled out on Friday as we went into Cinco de Mayo weekend with a whole bunch of uh, gambling possibilities and Sal and the crew delivered. Check that out. It, it, it is going to post, I think, on Wednesdays every week. Against All Odds with Cousin Sal. And by the way, don't forget, um, we have another podcast that we're launching this week. I'm not going to tell you who it's with, but it's going to launch on Thursday. So carve out an hour on Thursday for something, for an audio experience that you'll be waiting for. But you find out all the details tomorrow on Tuesday. We'll announce it on The Ringer. And then that launches on Thursday. Coming up on the 10th anniversary pod, The Ringer's Brian Curtis, The Wall Street Journal's Jason Gay. Let's do it. All right, as promised, Jason Gay, I think this is your first time on the on the BS podcast, right? On the Ringer, I was on a prior when you you worked at a different sports network. Yeah, you were on the on BS a prior Report. podcast. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Brian Curtis has been on on both. Yeah, yeah. a couple times. Yes. Double duty. So the sports reporters. Let's start there. We have a lot to the, we have a lot on the agenda here. The sports yeah. reporters ended on Sunday, and it was interesting. All these ESPN people bemoaning the sports reporter, but. I mean, the show did get canceled. <laughs> it's, it was the end of an era because they chose not to run the show anymore. But it did feel like the end of an era. What did it feel like for you, Brian? I mean, it was a great run, right? It felt like, uh, I think Jeremy Schapp, whose dad was the original yeah. host, tweeted out a picture of the original set. Yeah. And I had forgotten that there was like, you know, it was like Ali and Jimmy Cannon. I mean, it was yeah, it was kind of like this amazing museum piece, you know. But I remember as a kid, it was the most exciting thing in the world. The 80s, 90s sports reporter was, was amazing because I was like, oh, my God, there's this man in Philadelphia who's got this huge beard. He's this giant man. He's sitting at almost the Jack German 180 degree angle. You know, he's like almost <laughs> right. in the Barca lounger on the set. <laughs> and he writes about sports. And he's like, it's like it was like meeting somebody from another planet. You right. Know? And you'd never see sports writers all together in the same place like that. Yeah, so the three the of day, us. It was great. The three of us are sports media nerds and sports writing nerds, and this really was the first show where you could see everyone in the same place. You watched it too, right, Jason? Oh, of course. You know, I mean, and I love the sort of mannerisms of it. The what's they call the end? The, the parting shot. You know, when they would look straight into the camera and kind of laugh at each other's jokes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I do wonder, you know, where will we go now to find middle-aged men talking about sports on television? I don't know. <laughs> there doesn't seem to be. There does not seem to be another avenue. I mean, you know, look, a lot of these guys who came in and out of the show were giants. I mean, starting with Dick Schaap, of course. And, but it just, you know, it became very, very quickly outmoded in this day and age. And there was something almost like watching, I don't know, you know, chamber music to watching the sports reporters in 2017 compared to what sports talk has become. Yeah, it's tough to just parachute in on Sunday mornings and be like, I, we have we have takes that are 
more profound than the takes you've just been digesting for 24 straight hours. Right. And the tone being completely the opposite of everything else, even yeah. on ESPN, right? right? A sports reporters junior is around the horn where they're in a box and it's like a game show. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's like the anti sports reporters on the same network. I also remember from the eighties, nineties where it was like, when you got on there, you'd made it. I mean, you were, oh, you, yeah, had been, sure. you had been chosen, right? I remember Skip Bayless growing up reading him in Dallas and suddenly he was on the sports reporters and he would talk about that on the radio and stuff like, oh, I was on the sports reporters this week. That was a huge deal. Yeah. Cause it didn't mean you were just like big in a city. You were now national. You know, you were a guy. Now anyone could be national. Yeah. The other national. thing is locally, there were local versions of the sports reporters in different cities. Like Boston had sports final with Bob Lobel. Yeah. And that yeah. was always like Lobel, Dan Shaughnessy. Um, Bob Ryan and one other wild card. And it was basically the same format, but then the sports reporters was the national version of it. And I don't know, part of me wonders some of the people that were on it that made it great were probably overqualified to be on it. Like Kornheiser and Wilbon, like they clearly just deserve their own show. Right. And then once you have people who are properly qualified, that probably hurts it too. But D Jason, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Massachusetts. You oh, know? That's who would have thought another person from Massachusetts talking <laughs> yeah. sports? Who, Talk about who underrepresented like in the media. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you remember the the uh, the sports final with Lobel yeah. then. And the Lobel show, let's say, was a little looser. Uh, <laughs> I believe it was live. Yes. Uh, it came on after the Sunday 11 p.m. broadcast. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, and yeah, I just, you know, Bob was Bob and, and, and this is sort of a relic of another era when these sports writers would become titans. And I look at like what sports reporters came to be. Is there anything equivalent that felt as clubby as what the sports reporters was? I mean, it was, you know, Brian's right. It's like you had made it if you got into one of these chairs and got to look down the barrel of that camera. And it wasn't really a conflict driven show either. It was kind of like, we all have Golf memberships, yay! It didn't feel like this was some sort of like you know a place where they were going to solve the problems of the sports world. And that came from Dick Shap, right? Yes. Because he was so smooth, and he'd been on television in New York for such a long time before that on ABC, right? Yeah. And also, the Dick was Dick's funny because he had on the one hand he had legitimate literary bona fides, like he was a great writer. He wrote Terrific for Herald writer. Tribune, sport wrote, magazine, wrote Instant Replay, wrote all his books, right? Edited sport. But he was also somebody that everybody liked. You find any old sports writer, they all like Dick Shap. Yeah. Because Dick was yeah. kind of, you know, he gave him a seat on the sports reporters or he gave him a nice assignment in sport or gave him a nice little contract at sport, you know? Yeah. He was sort of this like literary godfather figure. I mean, I don't know who that would be now, but it's sort of like he was, you know, he was, he was all kind of, they were all kind of working for him in a way, you know? I never felt like the show... I, when he wasn't on it anymore, it just felt like a different show to me. And he was always the appeal to me. How First of all, I'd grown up with him, but the respect and reverence they had for him. And if he liked their take, it really felt like it meant something. Yeah. You know? It reminded me of David Brinkley, you know, when he had like uh, yeah. Sam Donaldson and Cookie Roberts and George Will, and they were the squabbling children. And he was kind of the elder statesman and kind of keep everybody or in line. Or Jim McKay is another one. Like we all grew up with Jim McKay. Yeah. And that was like, you know, he was like Buddha, the Olympics Buddha. And it just felt more important when he was there. But I, I do think that's a relic from another time. I wonder, Jason, do you think there are guys either in our age range or a tiny bit older that have reached that status to younger people? Because it feels like that's slipping away. Oh, I definitely do. And I think that, you know, and, and, and fairly, uh, anyone over 40 should be viewed with great suspicion in media. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I mean, another dynamic of the sports reporters, too, is like, let's not forget that, you know, a generation of sports writers, many generations of sports writers grew up thinking they were way above television. Uh, and thinking that TV was a domain of you know knuckleheads, and and that they were going to bring this kind of you know erudite um, analysis to the airwaves, and that was pervasive for a lot of this kind of television for a long time. Now that dynamic is completely different. Uh, you know, you see sports writers everywhere, except for the three of us, of course. You know, aspiring. <laughs> To television, fame, and fortune, and that is, you know, the, the the roadmap for a great many people. I don't think that in Dick Shap's era, they viewed it the exact same way. I think they kind of was like, we're going to show these people how it's done. We're going to show them what literary journalism is like on television. Yeah, you were a columnist who was appearing on television rather than a television personality who might once in a while write a column. Right. Right. Yeah. I I had it both ways. 
because <laughs> <laughs> sometimes if you're doing too much TV, it becomes hard to do the other stuff properly. But, and Jason, you also, you dabbled in the TV thing. I both, yeah. I think both of us were, I, I did a whole bunch of different TV things. Obviously the most fun I ever had was PTI. Mm. Cause, and that's what everybody says. And it almost sounds like a cliche, but there is something really fun about it. And I don't really totally understand what it is the structure of it i guess make maybe take some pressure off it's loose you go back and forth you're you're really doing takes but it doesn't seem like you are but you really are all this stuff's the same like if you watch wobon on pti he's spouting just as many takes as anybody else but it doesn't feel takey right and yeah. uh and it's just a really smartly constructed show and it's the only show that's been able to live outside this whole take world that we've entered now because it's yeah. um yeah because they don't take themselves seriously right Right. The whole thing is a bit from the beginning of PTI's. But, but do you think Stephen a, a takes himself seriously? Uh, yes. Okay. Because <laughs> sometimes I wonder. Sometimes he has a, a, a gleam in his eye. I think there's more tongue in cheek from the beginning of PTI, right? Look at right. us. We have this show. Oh, my God. And we have this a whole is list crazy. of topics on the screen. Yeah, yeah we're, we're bald. bald. We're this old and bald, and we have a show. Yeah. When I, I did a podcast with Stephen A like two and a half years ago, maybe, and I unsticked him. There was a lot there. I really had a good time. Wow. And I've, I've hung out with him at NBA things and stuff. And the non TV Stephen A is definitely a different person. The TV is like, a, it's like a blown out personality of what he has, but there's a, there's a lot of meat there. I think he just, he's playing, playing what he needs to play to, to, to get seen. What do you think, Jason? Do you think it's teachable? That's my question. I mean, can you make somebody great on television or is there some quality that they're born with? Now, I was on, you know, America's favorite sports show, Crowd Goes Wild. Yeah. yeah beautiful nine-month run. Uh, but at totally opposite ends of the spectrum, you had Regis Philbin, National Treasure, and then new National Treasure, Katie Nolan. And they could not be more opposites in so many ways, but they both possess this just incredible talent for kind of connecting through that camera in ways that I don't think if you could, you, you can really articulate. And, and that was something that I clearly didn't possess uh, on screen. And I don't know if that's a kind of teachable skill. Yeah, I would, Beetle is another one who has that. So certain people just jump off the screen. And, and when Stephen A is upset about something or ranting about something, it's hard not to watch. Oh, yeah. It's you know, whether I remember I was in the car once and I think I told you this story. He was yelling about, it was right when the bulls were self combusting and he was just yelling at Jeremy Grant <laughs> and I, I didn't intend to have the radio show on. It was just on when I got in the car and he's just yelling at Jerry. He's like, this isn't about you, Jeremy Grant. This isn't about you. <laughs> and he's just berating Jeremy Grant. And I, I'm thinking like, what is going on? But I couldn't turn it off. It was great. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't How many turn people it have you come across? in your television experience who are the exact same person off camera as they are Will Bond. Will yeah. Bond is exactly the same. Will Bond is exactly the same in all situations. Uh, <laughs> does not change, does not change what he would say. I, I was very enviable. Magic, magic was the opposite when we did the year of magic. Magic would be great in the meetings and then on TV he would be very careful. Yeah. Would, you don't want to be careful. I would say every play by play guy too or just about that's pretty much them. You know, yeah, you're right. you can't do a character for three hours. Right. I mean, that's really, really hard. Right. No. And a lot of them, when you're talking to them, it's almost like you, you, you started interviewing them, but you don't remember that it was, you know, be like, Hey, how's it going today? Well, let me tell you, Bill, it, uh, <laughs> you know, when you wake up and you have breakfast every day, you get to do this for a living. It's great. It's like, are we doing a talk show right now? Let's <laughs> right. <laughs> are we on air? Them, yeah. yeah. A lot of them are like that. The, the I, old, like Al Michaels before, is like that. I've heard you say before, Bill, that you know you don't know how like the single voice does it, like a coward type. And I've always wondered yeah. the same thing. You know, how do you not talk yourself completely into knots logistically um, and and beyond? I just that that's a skill set that I just I, I don't even, I can't even put my finger on it. Yeah, I was watching Rosillo. He had his first show after they got rid of Danny Cannell, and he just gave this like ten minute monologue about you know how this guy was it was really good and i was like that's to be able to basically give a verbal essay off the cuff is really hard i i have trouble doing it i always need to on the podcast i always need to have somebody to play off of i've had a couple times i remember 
near like in March of 2015, I remember doing, it was the ESPN.com's like 15th anniversary or 20th anniversary or something. I remember doing a pod where I just, it was just me for 40 minutes. That was the only time I've ever done that. And I thought I did a really good job of it. And then I listened to it and I kept saying like, and um, and like, <laughs> you, you really have to be comfortable with silence. I always felt like that was Jim Rome's greatest trait. Jim Rome would have this point. And it would pause and then he would make the point, but you'd be hanging yeah. on the silence. And it was like, the silences are the key to that. I'm not good at that. Yeah. By the way, would you watch yourself on television? Would you go back and review tape? I did in, in uh basketball. Yeah, I did. I, you know, you learn stuff. The stuff you learn is if you're fidgety, if, uh, if you, if you have some tick, you didn't know you were doing. I remember in basketball, the first, uh, the first like five or six times I did the show, I was like tapping my pen on the table, <laughs> like a serial killer. And I didn't even know what I was doing it. I just, it wasn't like I was nervous. You just have a lot of energy. You must've noticed that yeah. too, right, Jason? Like you oh, have yeah, these sure, of course. little stupid. And what you realize is you have to be frozen. You know, yeah. I'd be making these points to the, when we were doing with, uh, the first like few months of the NBA show and I'd be making points and magic Wilbon would just be calmly frozenly staring at me as I made the points and I'd be talking going, are they listening to me? But I realized <laughs> why they were doing it because it looks terrible when people nod, it looks terrible yeah. when people are like smiling and not smiling and they're, they're just basically, they're rolling over to help you make your, your point. But yeah. Yeah. The podcast equivalent is when you say right every 10 seconds, right. or you're like on here when you listen to an interview tape and you're the person's talking, you're going, right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. right, right. <laughs> and you do that if somebody's on the phone because you're trying to prompt them, you know, like yeah. these three men, I just want the America to know that a three man podcast with two in person, one on the phone is hard because the person on the phone never knows when to jump in. Fortunately, Jason's an experienced professional. Yeah, of course. Of yeah. Hey, you wrote about LeVar Ball. Who mm. is uh, 2017's most polarizing sports figure? I enjoy. Is there it. another side of it though? That's what I want to know. Like I thought it's just one side. Everyone just can't stand Levar Ball. I enjoy it. I'm on the other side. Okay. All yeah, right. I Good. enjoy it. I listened to him on Undisputed this morning, and I thought it was fabulous. I mean, I just every moment. I'm sorry. I mean, it was just great. It was everyone knew. It was a con. Yeah. But it was just great. It was 15 minutes of wonderful radio, TV through the radio for me. G give the uh, listeners the synopsis of what you wrote yesterday, Jason. I mean, listen, he's just another example of how the media culture now works, that the loudest voice in the room wins. And we've seen it all across the spectrum. And that LeVar Ball is basically calling out every um, you know, predisposition we have now. He knows that being ridiculous, being loud, uh, the craziest price for a pair of basketball sneakers and, you know, manufacturing history, that's attention getting. And though, you know, the media likes to sort of play it both sides out of their mouths, people can't get enough of it. And they're going to keep, keep, keep putting them on the air. And, you know, I thought it was funny with him when he did first take, when he did undisputed. Fits in perfectly, absolutely perfectly. Like he's been coming on for years. He's like the Tony Randall of that kind of format. <laughs> yeah, I liked him with Stephen A. I thought it was hilarious. Yeah, it's like that. It's like at least they're owning what this show is. It's two people ridiculously yelling at each other. That's right. What, that's the destiny of the show. Right. And this is this is good guy and this is bad guy. Yeah. Right. Do you, you buy any of the the overarching worry here though that you know somehow he is talking his son out of you know tens of millions of dollars potentially that he could be maybe even damaging a relationship with a GM and a team and some team might have, I, I find that preposterous. The idea that a basketball team wouldn't draft a once in a generation talent because of the dad's television appearances, but the money part, there might be some truth to that. I don't know. I wasn't in the room for what the Nike Adidas kind of negotiations were and how absurd that was. And also there's another part of this, which is rookies don't get big giant shoe deals anymore. That's not really a thing that happens. And so I find it very hard to believe that if he comes back, I mean, or he comes out and he has you know a great rookie season or two, that these shoe companies won't come running at him hard. Uh, but do you do you buy any of this sort of danger for Lonzo because of that? I'll let Brian go first. There's got to be a point, right, where yeah. if you draft him and he's just trashing your coach or GM on the radio, <laughs> if he's on Undisputed all the time, which, by the yeah. way, to Jason's list of like things he has going for him loud and stuff is available. Yeah. Right. He can call and he answers the telephone. Right. Um, there is a point where that becomes annoying. 
Right. And, 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 and I don't know, maybe that point is we way off. We reached that the- point three months ago. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I'm telling you, teams, there are teams out there that are afraid to take them because of this. Do you think? For yeah. Two, yeah. Here, for two reasons. One, because if you're in a situation where that son's not going to play all the time right away and you have the crazy dad on the side going, I don't know why my son's yeah. not playing. He's better in the backup. Like, that's just bad. And that's in play. That might actually happen here. And sure. then the second one is he's been so open about wanting his son to go to the Lakers yeah. that yeah. even let, – let's say you're the Celtics, right? You have this uh, good chip lollipop routine going right now. Everybody's on the same page. Things are going well. You made the second round of the playoffs, so you're unfortunately going to flame out in about two games. But um, but you, you bring this kid in who's going to have to take a big ego hit. He's not going to play a lot the first year. And now you have LeVar Ball bitching about it. And then in four years, he might go to the Lakers. You know, if you're, if you're draft, if, especially in this draft, where it's like probably the best draft in 14 years, I want somebody that's going to be on the Celtics for 12 years. I don't want somebody that I'm worried in three years he might be jumping to the Lakers with his brother. You know, so I, I think it's, I don't know if it's enough to drop him four spots, but I think if the right team is in the second spot, and they look at it and they weigh all the, like, are we just better off taking Josh Jackson? It's conceivable. And I, and that's why I think what he's doing is smart. He's Because he wants a kid to go to the Lakers. If the Lakers have the third pick, he might be able to nudge him to that third pick or get the Lakers to trade up or whatever. That makes sense. He also just got, he reportedly just got the Chino Hills coach fired, right? The high school coach. Yeah. So why isn't he going to do that to Luke Walton? You know, half. If, if, Maybe he'll be the coach. Yeah, I think, but he thinks he probably could, right? I, I mean, do think the Lakers would be the best team for him because of Magic, and I, I just love the Magic Johnson slash uh, Lonzo Ball Showtime two point and Magic doing the whole thing, and that it would be the most fun fun of all the storylines. Yes, we can all agree, absolutely. Levar Ball right down the street. From UCLA. How's he going to get his next son there? UCLA playing. Like, it's, it would be the most fun, but it would also be super fun if the Lakers didn't get a pick at all. <laughs> for you. <laughs> yeah. For me and everybody else who's hated the Lakers over there. So, Jason, did you get feedback that you think this is going to hurt his draft stock? No. In fact, you know, a number of people have sniffed around on the topic, and they have not gotten a GM to confirm privately even that they are, have a hesitation about him. But, you know, I do buy what you're saying in terms of, you know, situationally, if you're going to have him sitting behind somebody in Boston, certainly would be that kind of scenario. Yeah, you know, has the father shown restraint in the past? No. Uh, could it be potentially a problem? But, I, again, it, you know, talent's talent, and, and we've seen, you know, crazier sports parents. Well, maybe not. Uh, but there's a pretty rich history of sports parents uh, being somewhat insane pre-draft. Yeah, I don't – Richard Williams, to me, I was – that's kind of he. I've seen Ball get compared to Richard Williams. Richard Williams, I don't know. This feels more fun to me and more entrepreneurial. And he's just, it's like he's taking his swing. Richard Williams was, there was always a creepy element to it. And it, and you could always kind of see where that one was going. It was heading. Yeah. This is a lot sillier than that. This is much sillier. And, and yeah. I also think Lonzo's going to be really good. And that's going to solve a lot of problems too. It's not like he's going to come in and shoot. 32 percent the first year or anything like that i like having wacky sports parents in my life <laughs> is that wrong <laughs> i mean we you know, also, why do why do why, why, why does archie manning and why, why does uh jack elway you know we, we, we've seen some big parent maneuvering pre-draft no, before yeah. getting guys out of Baltimore. hell yeah I, yeah i forgot about that archie manning was was Le, like a quieter lavar ball <laughs> dignified southern <laughs> lavar ball like we, didn't, we never really got an answer for why he was so afraid to have his kid play for the Chargers. It's not like the Chargers were the Cleveland Browns. No. And everybody likes Good to move, live in, though. Everybody loves to live in San Diego. Um, quick break to talk about texture. How do we keep this podcast fresh? I read a ton of stuff every day, including a bunch of magazines on the texture app. Oh, Brian got excited. Just now. <laughs> uh, texture gives me access to hundreds of magazines like the Atlantic, New York Magazine, the New Yorker, and SI, all in one place on my tablet or phone. Daily recommendations, exclusive interactive features, videos, and more. Texture makes it easy to find and enjoy the articles I want to read. It's even searchable. You can mark what you like, check out back issues, view bonus content. It was selected as one of Apple's top 2016 iPad apps. And I read everything. On my iPad, just about. Where do you read everything on? Yeah. Where do you, iPad? Same. Yeah. What do you read on, Jason? Yeah, I'm going back to print. 
Good. Uh, Good. I'm, I'm, I'm like that old enough. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, Texture is nine ninety nine a month for access to over two hundred magazines. But if you sign up right now at texture.com slash BS, you get a fourteen day free trial. What is better than that? Why subscribe to a couple of magazines when you could subscribe to all of them? Start your free trial now. Download the Texture app today. Go to texture.com slash BS for your 14-day free trial. Uh, texture's good. Great. I like that. It's I, I get magazines in the mail now, and I just feel stupid. I never got to stick can open it just, Where's the time? And, I, and somehow I keep getting... Sports Illustrated, even though I feel like I've canceled it nine times. I tried to turn it off for like two years and it kept coming. It's like the Jason Voorhees of magazines. My my big move nowadays is to go, you know, when I'm flying, to go to the Hudson newsstand before the flight, buy a stack of magazines, and then put them on the seat next to me and never read them. (laughs) But you felt like you... Yeah, you felt like you at least put in the effort. I made the statement. Yeah, that was just, that was enough. So we were talking about the take culture, which ties into uh, ESPN layoffs, and um, which you know, ESPN for I, I don't think I've really talked about the ESPN layoffs on, on the pod. I have a bunch of thoughts that I'm probably for the most part going to keep to myself because I'm a little too close to it. But I do think. You know, reading that ESPN is done, and reading that this is it, and this is some turning point, like. Clearly, it's not. I, I think they. It was an incredibly, unbelievably successful company. Probably the most successful media company or media network ever. Um, and now it's not quite as successful. But you know, they hired a lot of people, and they had a lot of excess, and they had every possible thing covered. And now it seems like they're making specific choices to try to decide what to focus on which is what most successful businesses would do. On the other hand, there was a coldness to how this played out, and especially with the, uh, with the NBA coverage. That was very atypical for ESPN. What did, you, what did you think, Brian, watching it from afar? Well, I think the first thing is we were sold that it was gonna be a big TV thing. Yeah. And then as it manifested itself, it became a print thing, you know, or a reporter-driven thing. And I think for all of us who are mostly print-ish people, right, yeah. that was pretty jarring. I have a feeling with John Aaron wrote this that a, a, some or maybe a lot of TV guys got the thing where it said, look, we're going to cut your pay by 60% or whatever it is, and you get to keep your job, yeah. right? Uh, and they said yes to that. So we never actually found out about some of the TV cuts that were made, you know, like that's all kind of behind the scenes. But the ones we found out about these brutal sort of guys like, hey, you write a soccer column, goodbye. You know, right. you write about hockey, goodbye. So, uh, you do a good, you, you do a good job, right? You're not, a, you don't do a bad job but you're out of here. Yeah. So that to me was initially the most jarring thing. What about you, Jason? Well, sort of the way it went down to the nature of it, just, you know, these heads would pop up on social media saying like, you know, listen, you know, they called my number today and that sort of that drumbeat continuing for a couple of days was really odd and, and, and unsettling. And listen, it's really impossible to find a media organization uh, today that has not gone through some version of this. And what I find a little bit uh, tough to swallow is just people kind of wrapping it up into some kind of you know self-serving agenda or cultural statement about where ESPN is or isn't heading. And you know these are people's individual lives and livelihoods, and you know, that's that's tough. Um, I do think the thing that I don't have a sense for is the why and the why this way. Um, I have yet to have you know get get a real sense for. You know, if you're going to make a cut, why make the cut in the version? There's no sort of clear line, it seems to me, here as to why they did they cut the people that they cut. Um, there wasn't one sort of specific thing. I mean, I know they made big trims to baseball, you know, trims to basketball, and I know there's the element of whether or not uh, Wojnarowski comes over from Yahoo. Uh, but it's, in, you know, in the absence of ESPN sort of coming forward and saying, like, these are our priorities, uh, the rest of us are kind of guessing. Yeah. It does seem like part of the issue is their website changed, their ability to display content changed. They can really yeah. only push a couple of comms or features, whatever per day in a big way. And other than that, it's just really hard to find stuff. Yeah. So can I ask a dumb question though? Like, oh, you know, when you say website, 
Yeah. You know, I'm thinking, okay, the homepage. And, you know, all we hear here, you know, at the Wall Street Journal is that the homepage, you know, that becomes less and less and less important every second. I mean, people are experiencing our content through, you know, social media primarily are referencing it from other friends and so on. The homepage, you know, while still a factor, isn't the big driver of traffic. And, and I look at ESPN's web homepage now, and, you know, you're right, it's 100% video centric, and it's awfully hard to find written articles until you go deep, deep, deep down. But is that the main purveyor of their content right now? It would, it would seem like the written stuff has become less important. I know from our experience at Grantland and the experience we're having now at The Ringer, um, the homepage still matters to us, but I, I think, I don't think that's typical. I, I think what we found is if you have, if you build something that you're very carefully picking how much content you're putting up and yeah. the content all complements each other and it's not overwhelming, people will still go to a homepage. My issue with ESPN and the reason I, I hadn't gone there as much, um, the last year is that it was just really hard to find stuff. Yeah. And it was just all over the place. And they, they've never really been able to solve that. I hate being the old school guy. I was like, oh, I liked it back, better the old way. But it was just easier to look at the site the old way, especially on a desktop. And you could see 10, 11 pieces at the same time. I think there's clean home pages out there. But, um, but they clearly, they had too much NBA content. I think it was really hard to keep track of everything. And at some point, they probably looked at it and said, all right, let's pick and choose what we're putting our chips behind. Um, getting rid of hockey and soccer, basically, and a lot of baseball, is really shocking to me. Because yeah. ESPN, the whole time I was there, ESPN was always like, we have to be everywhere. We have to be, we have to have something for everybody. We have and, to be global. You know? yeah. yeah. And now they're saying, we don't have to be everywhere. We're we're going to double down behind baseball, basketball, and football, and college. College, yeah. And and uh, and we're going to have investigative reporting, and we're going to have big features, and we're going to have some columnists that you know. Um, we're going to have some podcasts, but not as many. We're kind of stripping it down, and we don't have something for everybody anymore. Yeah, and I think that's the through line. If you had to do anything, it's just scaling back ambitions, right? 15 years ago, ESPN was going to go into every city and basically compete with or knock out the local sports page, right? Yeah. That was ESPN yeah. Dallas and Boston and all that stuff. And then we see like, oh, wait, they just don't have that was a, 10 years ago, 10 years yeah. ago. They don't have a Rockets beat writer anymore because right. they're just probably out of that business, right? Uh, I think the beat writers are the next thing that's probably going to be put chipped away at, you know, just saying like, do we need gamers on all this stuff. We're going to send people on the road, right? That's what they were doing. You know, they were literally going in and just matching. We're going to match the Mets writer. We're going to match the Yankees writer. We're going to match the columnist in New York. We're going to do all those things and then have the radio bit and all that stuff. And I think they're just going to come. I think that's now they look at that and go, wow, that was ambitious. Well, or that gotten, was for a time when we were making money at a totally different rate. And that, that, that was also a bad bet because their intention was to have these local radio stations that competed with the local stations in Boston, New York, Philly. All those shows get destroyed. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're talking like like in Boston, I, they have two stations, by the way, two all sports stations. And I think both of them get like 40, 40 times as much, 40 times as many listeners as ESPN Radio does. So I think they realized over time that they just couldn't compete with a national radio show in cities where they just want to hear. If you're in Boston now, you just want to hear, hey, what's, what's wrong with Xander Bogarts? Why doesn't he have a home run yet? Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. when does Brock Holt come back? They don't care about like the the <laughs> Warriors series. They just don't. They want to hear about the None Red Sox. Yeah, and, and 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 you know, with entirely due respect to any individual who lost a job, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's great that there's some sort of you know victory for regionals here in the respect that you know local coverage has won out, whether it's radio or newsprint. Newsprint, God. Um, but you know that that sort of dynamic and 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 those guys prevail, uh, prevailing. I think that's okay. Yeah, I d I also think there was a feeling in the mid two thousands that newspapers were going to die. Yes, and that Any ESPN. Yeah, that ESPN was basically going to become Starbucks, and it'd be like, all right, in Boston, you have ESPN yeah. Boston. That's going to replace the Boston Globe. Absolutely. Yeah. And what what you've seen is. The newspapers have found a way to to kind of reinvigorate them. The Washington Post, New York Times, Boston Globe, all of them have yeah. these subscription models now 
that are going to enable them to stick around. Newspapers also and really. And sports as a driver for, you know, especially something like the Globe. I mean, you'll just look at what, you know, the Patriots coverage and so on. is It's just, right. you know, that, that they're, they're, they're much more important than City Hall. Yeah, and I was just going to say, remember how shitty newspaper websites were when those ESPN oh, yeah. microsites started sure. up? Yeah. yeah. They would say, like, we're going to have our football writer write one article at the end of the day that has all yeah. the news of the day in it. Yeah. And then the ESPN guy updated. comes along and we're going to write 10. Yeah. And every little micro nugget is going to be a thing. ESPN taught newspapers, I would say, how to do that. Or newspapers sort of figured it out eventually. And now if you look, there's really no difference but between what's the way they cover is, the beats. Remember in the 70s, the newspapers would have like the three editions? Oh, yeah. Like the, the, oh, Globe, sure. the Globe would have like the nighttime edition <laughs> that would have some column that wouldn't even be in the next paper. That goes to yeah. Maine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it would just yeah. disappear. Yeah. Guys you'd go to Cape Cod and you'd read like Bob Ryan's like, you know, pregame Celtics column that he just cranked out <laughs> yeah. 45 minutes before the game. And at and the end of the brilliant. first quarter, the Celtics led by two points. <laughs> right. Last, last sentence. Yeah. Or he would do like, uh, you know, scattered thoughts before the playoff game. And you'd be reading that in, in like Portland, Maine, because they wouldn't have time to get the uh, other newspaper. Yeah. So yeah. I do. Oh, then, and the West Coast trips, forget it. You got nothing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I do think. I think that was part of it. They made a huge, huge expensive bet on taking over all these local sites and gradually realized that that wasn't going to work. But the part that's fascinating to me is that they now have to pick and choose what sports they're going to really care about, right. you know, and like soccer, especially like John Skipper, who obviously I know pretty well, loves soccer. This is his favorite sport and was really, really intent on, you know, they made a great bid on the world cup. They were kind of blowing up soccer domestically. Then Fox came flying in. Then Turner came flying in and got the Champions League. And to me, it, see, it seemed like ESPN just kind of threw their chips in and said, all right, take them. We're out. We can't, we can't win this. And I don't know, man. You don't have soccer. You don't have hockey. They're kind of stuck with baseball. And it's been really interesting to, to read all these people blaming the football deal and the bat and the basketball deal, all these like, oh, the rights deal, the quarter, they but like that's partially true. They would do the NFL and the NBA deals again. You think they wouldn't want to have the NBA right now? Like, give me a break. That was what was so funny to me because five years ago, what did we hear? What was the one thing everyone knew about cable? You, the only thing people watch is live sports. Yeah, the only thing that's DVR proof. Right, yeah. and maybe still the case. Maybe they overpaid, quote unquote, in some way for these deals. But I'm like, what are you going to do? You're going to be out of business with the NFL? You're gonna be out of business with the NBA. What's gonna be on? Well, they, we're, the gonna watch, we're gonna watch branded branded argument shows and sports centers like I'm, that's just not, over and over again. And yeah. also, if if Fox gets the NBA, no. now you're really now you're creating a real competitor because if you look at the FS1 ratings like during October during baseball, they're right. they're way up there, and then it comes down once football ends. If you give them basketball, now you're legitimately creating a second competitor. I think that the baseball deal is the one that really hurt them. Because but what I don't even understand exactly how it's supposed to work, though. Isn't there some sort of like um, property sharing that's going to happen with MLB now? Well, they what's that? The four o'clock intentional talk. Show? Yeah, that's yeah. but that was that was kind of the underrated shocking moment. Stag MLB. It, we're going to put an MLB network show on our air. Yeah. I mean, that to me was an outsourced show because you, you say like, where are the used to the old ESPN where we're going to cover the world. We're going to cover every sport. We're going to cover everything, but also we're going to have our own version of everything. Right. Right. And now we're going to outsource something to MLB network, our baseball talk, prime real estate too. I mean, that's just amazing to me. I remember at the last two years at Grantland, when they were trying to get us to do TV, more TV, we need you on TV, we add sales, more TV, more TV, do TV. Um, we were looking at the ESPN2 slot, like could, could we do, I don't know, a Grantland hour, what, what would a Grantland show look like? And ESPN2 was like, that real estate was just crowded and it was like, there was no way you could get in. All right. All and right. now now three years later, Kevin Millar and, and Chris Rose, they're just gonna like simulcast a, an MLB network show. That is insane to me. They have nine state-of-the-art buildings in Bristol. Where all they're supposed to do is make television <laughs> and they have to outsource the show. What was your reaction to that, Jason? I mean, that just seems crazy, but it also sort of says to, you know, 
underline the point that the business they're in is the entertainment business, right? And the relationship that they're going to have to coverage is going to be they're going to cover principally the things that they're invested in. And, you know, football and basketball are their top two investments, and that's where they did the least amount of cutting, it appears. And, you know, when they're going to reinvest in, in Adrian and so on and do all this other stuff. I mean, that's a pretty clear statement about where you are going. And, uh, you know, maybe it's the sort of if there is an era's end. And again, I, I, I sort of I hesitate to jump on that bandwagon because virtually every media organization has gone through some version of this. But if there is an era's end for ESPN, it's the kind of just intergalactic dominance, that we are going to be the thought leader in every imaginable corner of sports in both the United States and the globe. And that just is not going to be the case. Yeah. The the real narrative here is there have been smaller pieces that they gave away. Baseball Tonight 20 years ago is, is an institution. Sure. It's one of the three or four most valuable properties they have. They've not thrown it out the window. They have said, Baseball Tonight's dead. We're just going to do it on Sunday nights, basically. ESPN2 was this channel that they had really boosted up to the point that not only were they showing playoff games, all these different things on it, but first take becomes more pop or becomes more highly rated going against ESPN one sports center, right? Now they're throwing away ESPN two. It feels to me. Yeah. It's it's a channel now and they did this before, right? They threw away ESPN News. They threw away ESPN Classic. When when I was there, like two thousand ten, two thousand eleven range we wanted to save ESPN Classic. Connor and I were writing all these memos about, hey, we think this could be a sports movie channel. Um, here's what we would do. You have all these libraries of games. We could basically make it like uh, like the stars for sports movies. I used to jokingly call it Balls with a Z, <laughs> B-L-L-Z. <laughs> It'd be like sports movies, uh, 30 for 30 library, old games, we'll blow it out. And they were basically like, we don't care. like. People pay, they, the distributors pay for ESPN Classic anyway. We're already getting paid on that. We don't need to spend money on something that we're getting a check for. Right. Yeah. So my whole argument yeah. was always, all right, there's four ESPN channels right now. I guess five because ESPN Deportes is a channel. And you're just throwing away ESPN News and ESPN Classic. Like those have ESPN in their name. Why would we want to throw away channels? And they just didn't care. Now they're throwing away ESPN2, it seems like to me. Am I wrong to think they're throwing it away? It feels like they are. It feels like the second tier stuff. Yeah. Does it feel like? And, and some games in college. Yeah. It's basically a live rights channel now. Which is that's what's important, right? Yeah. We need another place to stick that Big Ten game yeah. on Saturday afternoon. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. that's what it is. I think also there's some analog to what newspapers went through a generation ago in this respect that they're trying to do two things at once. You have to. You know, hold the line as much as you possibly can on the classic cable model, which, you know, listen, still throws off a tremendous amount of money. But at the same time, you know, all of us have seen how a 13 year old to a 25 year old now, you know, processes media. They're yeah. just not traditional viewers anymore. And so you have to react strongly to that. And so they're simultaneously trying to migrate all their program across all platforms. Uh, and, and that's a tricky thing to do. It's hard to be two things. And, and, and I think that's the real question for them, if they can do that. Do your thing about uh, how basketball Twitter has ruined highlight shows. <laughs> I mean, just that the basketball Twitterverse is so much better at finding the detail of games, the crazy things that happen that, you know, I didn't watch the Warriors game the other night, so I don't know if they called attention to the Durant stuff, but basketball Twitter certainly caught it, and I'm talking about, like, cussing out the mascot and so on, and these just beautiful nuggets that tell you a lot about what's happening in the game and about individual player personalities that you almost never see when you're quote unquote behind the scenes of the game. I always laugh when they show you the in the huddle. I mean, has any interesting piece of information ever been revealed in the history of in the huddle? It's always like, <laughs> we're going to go inside the huddle. They're like, all right, guys, let's go. You know, it's nothing, <laughs> nothing, you know, material to the game. They're not allowed to, they actually have a screener for those. Do you know that? I'm sure. For inside the huddle. Each, each team, I, I forget if it's an NBA representative or somebody from each team. And if Brad Stevens says, like, look, we got to attack Kelly Oubre. That guy can't shoot. Like, this Celtics representative be like, you're not keeping that. <laughs> so that's why it's always, all right, guys, Too come on, intensity, intensity. Let's do yeah. this. 48 yeah. minutes. Let's go. Yeah. 
Can that, you, in this day and age, could you possibly have a feed of a game that was just the hot mic on the court, catching all the player chatter? I mean, obviously players would have a problem with it, and it probably would result in like people toning down the trash talk. But it would be absolutely fascinating and incredibly popular from the jump, I think. Yeah, I think so. We'll but never get it. There's no way. Yeah. <laughs> there's no way at all. The sidelines are the most regulated journalistic zone in sports. You know, yeah. we see it with football. If right. you could actually write, you'd be down there, sideline reporter, and, and quoting and writing down and giving to the audience what you heard on the football sidelines, it'd be fabulous. You can't. Can't do it. Can't do it. The, well, the, and most sideline reporters, they just don't know. They just don't know what to do with that job because it's a job that has been so marginalized and I diluted that it's not like you can ask anyone interesting. That's why I was like David Aldridge. David Aldridge asks great sideline questions. He's always like, John Wall, you started yesterday. John Wall, you started at 0 for 9. Uh, how did you keep your confidence? What happened? You know, like John Wall has to answer that. So yep. then he's like, well, you know, I missed some early layups. I wanted to keep shooting. But most people, they go, they go and like John Wall talk about uh, talk about that win. That's Brian's big what thing. What does on this Twitter. win mean to you? Yeah, yeah, what does this win mean to you? Talk about coming back. How big was that? <laughs> what was going through your head when you won? <laughs> it's so stupid. And then the and then to, on top of it to have the coach interviews. So yeah, it's yeah. like the NBA's on the one hand, the TV networks in the NBA are they're trying to get this inside. Here's what, it, but it's not. And then Twitter actually has it. And it's like, look at this. Durant just dropped an F-bomb on the Utah mascot. It's like, I'm not going to find that out in during the game. But I think there's this overarching thing here that I think we're in sort of a high point for interesting athletes. I mean, I think a lot of guys are sort of letting fans behind the curtain through social media or something else. And they're finding that there's a real upside to it. They connect with people. People think, okay, they're not robots. They're not just sponsors. And in many ways, you know, regular television hasn't caught up to this. I mean, no. why not, you know, let people know what Kevin Durant really is like on the court? Why, you know, there'd be, you know, all the stories over the years. I mean, everything I ever heard about Larry Bird on the court was like, you know, fifth hand because, you know, I was never close enough to hear anything he had to say. But he'd be a, a completely appreciated in a completely different way nowadays. Yeah, but I, th I think I'm that just like throwing fish to you here, Bill. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yes, you're you're right. I, gonna... I almost passed out. <laughs> was like Bill's smiling so broadly, I have to answer this question. <laughs> what a 10th anniversary present. But I think you answered your own question, which is they led people behind the curtain very much on their own terms, right? Yes. And on these very highly, you know, highly sort of scripted kinds of things. Even if it's called unscripted, it's actually scripted, right? And the court is unscripted. And they don't want that. You no, know, that's scary. That. Oh, you heard what I said to some guy on the court? Right. I didn't mean that. Yeah. Oh, we just say that on the court. That doesn't have any meaning. That's like every Kevin Durant post-game press conference, right? But when Kevin, when you get Kevin Durant in the right place, then he'll actually talk about it. But you can't – I think that would terrify them if but, everybody knew what they but, were saying. But do you – I mean, I, 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 I believe 100% in what you're saying that, you know, the, these are very sort of scripted, let you behind the scenes moments. But – Sometimes real personality wins out. I mean, like, look at the Dion Waiters Players Tribune essay, the, the high point in the history of the Players Tribune, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, if not sports you know, journalism as a whole. Yeah. Spectacular. Um, you know, this is a classic example of sort of access journalism and yet worked. And I feel like I know the guy and like the guy even more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as a journalist, I I'd love like it. Him. I'd love to hear it all. Well, we should, we should, the players should call us up and tell us what they dreamed the night, you know, before the game, but I, I think was, they're I not going to do it. Well, but that like the Durant podcast, I did the two. So that's as candid as anybody's been, who's a top five athlete in any sport in the last couple of years. And you would think when he's doing it, he's like, I'm worried. What'll be the repercussions to this? He just didn't care. And guess what? Nobody cared. I mean, people yeah. cared. They love the interview and that kind of stuff. But it wasn't like people spent the next four days picking, oh, can you believe he said this? Can they, they just appreciated that he was candid. And that's what I don't understand about some of these guys. Like, why are they so afraid to just be themselves? Well, what, are no they, what, are they, what are they terrified of? Yeah, I mean, look, look, look I mean, nothing's funnier than the, 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 you know, career transition of Alex Rodriguez, you know, the most robotic athlete interview in baseball history, all of a sudden reborn as a truth-telling television analyst. I mean, it is one of the funniest, I never would have thought in a million years that he would have worked perfectly on television and, and been a candid voice, and yet here we are. We have to take a quick break. And then, then I have some. I want to talk about the Players Tribune because I'm, that that is a very important conversation. The following is not an offering of securities. Private investments are highly illiquid and risky and are not suitable for all investors. Past performance 
is not indicative of future results. Security offered to accredited investors through North Capital Private Securities member FINRA slash SIPC. All right. How do you get involved in real estate group investing? Do you know, Brian? I have no clue. I bet you don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I didn't read that article Jason, in the Players' I bet you Tribune. you don't know either. Yeah, this was in the Players' Tribune. Thanks to RealtyShares.com, you no longer need billions to invest in vetted real estate assets. Realty Shares lets you invest fractionally and reduce the cost of an initial investment. I wish sports teams operated this way. I yeah. guess the Packers did. Yeah, they do. The Packers are the only one. Close to 100,000 investors nationwide are already using Realty Shares with over 60 million in principal return to investors. Manage and invest on your phone or computer. You only need 5,000 to make an investment. If you make 200,000 a year, you may qualify. Find out at realtyshares.com slash BS. Right now, they have a special offer just for the for our listeners. Go to realtyshares.com slash BS for $100 toward your first investment today. Once again, that is realtyshares.com slash BS. All right. Players Tribune. Did we, did we, we, we covered the ESPN stuff for the most part. We didn't talk about the Wojnarowski thing. You want to save that for your Channel 33 podcast? We can say whatever you want to do. To me, do you think it de Woj's Woj? That's what I want to know. Because <laughs> part of what made Woj Woj was that, or you know, he's a tremendous reporter and, and, and source, uh, you know, material. But uh, part of what made him such a uh, sensation over the last bunch of years has been his kind of like, you know, um, uh, sabotage of draft day and just sort of yes. beating ESPN to the punch always and kind of like sticking it to the man. And once he started joins a partner network, does it start to take a little bit away from him? Yeah, and it's, he said this explicitly. The draft is a TV event, and I have no stake in you know keeping the suspense on this made-for-TV event. Yeah, I'm just right. Gonna and you just imagine him like smoking a cigarette as he said it too. I mean, <laughs> yeah. just like there was just so great about it. Yeah, maybe even wearing a cape. You know, there's something very you know, <laughs> diabolical about it. In a wonderful. I don't way. work for ESPN. Yeah, and and it's funny, right? Someone whose career, except for a small portion, has been basically in opposition to ESPN yeah. designed and, and vocally. So all of a sudden reportedly goes over to ESPN and joins this parade. And well, I think they bought a site. Well, yeah, but I'm saying like, you know, now he's part as of ever, as everyone pretended they didn't know that two weeks ago, <laughs> where are all the sports media quote unquote reporters? <laughs> but I think he's sort of like, um, you know, that's going to be really funny right now. I'm yeah. participating in the made for TV event that there is the draft. I think that for them, Getting they, information is still matters and still is collateral to them. And having something go across the ticker that says ESPN's Adam Schefter reports blank is still really valuable to them. I don't know if you could put a price on it. For them to get their butts kicked by him for the last five years the way they did, I think they were just like, all right, what's the price? It really bothered them. We have them. to fix this. It really bothered them. Yeah. We talked to people in there, and that was an absolute. I mean, the fact they had, look, they had a lot of reporters, right? Yeah. Mark Stein, Ramona, all these people, you know, people who broke a lot of stories. Yeah. They hated the fact that there was this 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 entity called Woj yeah. that was taking all the Schefter style scoops away from them, or yeah. let's say most of them. But, Brian, I mean, some of the scoops were huge sort of, you know, league changing scoops, but a lot of them is just the, you know, day to day information, transactional information that happens in basketball yeah. or any other sport where you have a kind of Woj type reporter. And it's kind of like a new job. I feel it's like really, really come into its own over the last like, I don't know, three to four years where these guys are like less like sort of your classic journalists and they are kind of high frequency traders. They are people who are just pumping information instantaneously and seconds matter and yeah. it's just such a funny kind of job uh and i think it has you know obviously a hundred percent to do with social media and so on but there wasn't any equivalent to that you know 20 years ago i mean the will mcdonough's and you know pete vessies and things like that you know they certainly broke news and they were incredibly well sourced but they had the luxury of waiting time to release it yeah True. though i think it would have been i think uh Vessi and and mcdonough would have done this job if they'd had twitter yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that for them, Twitter accounts. I think the nugget was important and people on radio and they might have broken some of that. Remember, they were breaking some of that stuff on the McDonough was on the Sunday morning show yeah. right on the NFL, you know, in the NFL today. He's the first one to do it. Right. And he was using that as an advantage over his print guys who yeah. had to wait for the but rest that, of the day. Is that a bad thing? I mean, you know, Will McDonough, if, you, if he had become sort of a creature of Twitter, that would have robbed, you know, some very interesting and amusing Will McDonough columns <laughs> over the years. <laughs> I mean, you think of like Will what McDonough the, columns, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
but but like you know, think of the way the the the, the role of a White House correspondent has changed. I mean, gone, gone, gone are the days of the White House correspondent who would take in information and process it and write about it the next day or the next week even. Now everything has to be instantaneous. That job is just a monster. And sports jobs have changed in very much the same way. And I don't think that necessarily the net product is better. I, I agree with that. I think it's. I think we've created this kind of scoop or, or created more of this kind of scoop where it's like, I'm going to tell you something that's going to happen in two minutes. And because I have Twitter, I can do that. It's going to happen. It's yeah. going to be announced in two minutes anyway. And I'm going to quote unquote break the story. I'm so glad story, you brought right? this up. This is the part I don't get. And this is the part I have friends who cover these things, you know, that I would talk to about this and be like, why did, why does it matter? Like nobody yeah. who's keeping score. Is there some scoreboard I don't know about that? It's like, Oh, Mozgov's going to the Lakers 60 foot book by Woj. And, and it's like, so does he get, so that goes to his scorecard because I'm going to yeah. find out anyway that Mozgov's going to the Lakers. Yes. Like yeah. when there's real stuff, like Woj breaking that boogie was in advanced talks to go to new Orleans over all-star Sunday at all-star weekend. Right. That would, that was like, wow, this is real news. This is now starting a three day discussion. Um, but a lot of times it's just stuff that was going to be found out anyway. And that's the part that I don't get with this, like for, for what ESPN, what they're valuing this, they're valuing the, basically the ticker, but Woj is tweeting all these scoops. Yeah. So you're not, I mean, they don't the get way, his Twitter account. It's his Twitter account. So how do you reconcile <laughs> that? I, I, I'm speaking to you from the newsroom of the Wall Street Journal where, you know, information like this has absolute value, you know, monetary value on the street. You know, you find out that a CEO is getting canned and you're able to get that scoop out there. I mean, that is, you know, uh, a ledger altering kind of information. Whereas, you know, I don't know, is it fantasy? Like, what is the sort of upside to getting this, you know, seconds, if not half seconds ahead of the competition? I tell you what the upside is. It creates, uh, it makes the journalist into this huge swaggering figure, yeah. right? I mean, to me, sure. to me, the analog is Nikki Fink with Hollywood because she would write about this stuff and be like, I don't know who this executive is. I've never heard of this thing, but because she's breaking something and it's dangerous information, right? It gives yeah. her this majesty. And I think when a Schefter and Woj and those guys, it's the same thing you've created. You haven't, you haven't really the information you could argue is, is small time. And a lot of it would have been an agate type in newspapers, like the 28th pick in the NBA draft. Like, What's well, cares, volume, right? right? Yeah. But it creates this great character. Oh, Woj, you know, he's undermined, you know, he's Woj has got all the scoops. He got the Woj bombs, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's sort of built the character of the newsbreaker from Peter Vesey, who was big, but nothing like this into this guy. Who's like the biggest guy in sports media or one of the biggest guys in sports media. I mean, that's crazy to me. I do feel like Vesey was as big as this. I mean, he was on NBC. Because he, he was didn't huge. really have, but he also, the New York Post, like that column will come out on Tuesdays and yeah. Wednesdays and Fridays. And I lived in Boston and I knew what was in it, you yeah, know? But let's, let's compare, let's do well, salaries. They, let's do salaries sure. even with the, adjusting for inflation. <laughs> Good point. Peter Vesey would have loved. Yeah, Peter Vesey would have loved this era. And he definitely <laughs> would have taken more pot shots than Woj. I think Woj does a terrific job of working the circuit. Like I really respect uh how hard that dude works and how hard he's worked to cultivate the sources and all that but to me it's like i look at this and i think this is mostly about espn trying to save face with the fact that he was kicking their ass and that on the twi on their ticker on their channel they had to constantly write the verticals adrian wojnarowski first reported blank and you just you're gonna stop that you're gonna stop the hemorrhaging of that the part i don't get is this is an information play you care about being the one-stop shop for all NBA information. So you go get Woj and his crew. So then why do you get rid of Mark Stein? Mark Stein also had information. He breaks stories all the time. If you're making an information play, why not have both? They don't like each other, apparently. And, and if, this is all the, I mean, it's. And it's redundant. And if you're ESPN, I think you look and you say, well, we're hiring the guy with this many scoops. So why do we want the other guy with 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 that many scoops I mean, so I it's think almost that's like it is, a, it's right? like an nba team with a salary cap like we're going to yeah, get and it is we're going to get paul george i don't need jay crowder anymore and look it is a salary cap right as we just found out at espn yeah. maybe it's not fair maybe it's stupid maybe it's about impressing disney but it is a salary cap yeah you know stein stein i i just i'm shocked by it i mean obviously he's my friend so i'm biased but uh i thought he did great work for them and uh broke a lot of stories and was a, was a staple of that website. This is the irony, and I'm sure Jason would agree with this, which is 
ESPN was lauded for all its basketball journalism, right? Yeah. They had creative magazine stories. They had True Hoop. They had funny, strange writers. A lot of their local beat writers were beloved characters, including Strauss, who just got laid off in this thing, right? They're people who yeah. have huge things. And now they are changing the very character of that NBA unit. Mark Stein, a great guy, and I agree. It was every interaction I've had with him has been wonderful. Well, not to mention, to, I mean, the Grantland, by year four of Grantland, the NBA staff yeah, waiting to assemble Zach, was, yeah. was outrageous. I but mean, now we they, had the most talent under one roof that anyone's ever had. They looked at that and said, we want to change completely the character of this NBA staff. And we're going information. Yeah. And we still have Zach as a columnist. We have Ramona and... Uh, Who's, who's, I'm blanking on uh, Ramona and somebody else on features reported Windhorse. Yeah. Um, and then a couple of, couple of smaller, like quicker hit columns and that's our coverage and maybe some beat writers and a couple, couple of the big cities. Yeah. Maybe that's all you need. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, uh, to ask a really nerdy question. What do you do if you're, you know, a 20 year old student who wants to be a sports writer uh, in 2017, when you watch this, what is the takeaway? You know, Bill, I mean, all of us, we grew up probably in an era where we had editors say to us, you got to find a beat, you got to find a home, you got to find something that you know inside and out. You can't be a generalist. And now I think the, um, you know, there's been a dramatic pivot where range is everything and not just range across several subject matters, but also ability to do audio, video, in addition to print. You can't just be one thing. And if you get locked in too hard, that's a tough place to be sometimes. I agree with that. I So here here would be my counter to that because I've heard that, like, like people in college, like, well, what do I do? Well, first of all, writing is always going to matter, whether you're writing yeah. for a website, a magazine, a newspaper, or you're writing TV copy, like being a good writer is still an advantage. So, you know, read and write as much as you possibly can. I don't think that's changed. Um, I do think being able to know how to do a couple different things is a good thing, you know? Um, yeah. but, but couldn't you have said that 15 years ago? I mean, maybe it just occurs more to people now. That it's good to be to, good to have a diversity of skills. I would argue that it was always good to have a diversity of skills. It always was, but they didn't give you a radio show when you were 22 years old. And they give you a podcast when you're 22 years old now, True. right? So I think it's just the access is different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a tough question. I think with journalism funerals, as we're having, as we've had for the last <laughs> couple of weeks, we all kind of, it, we're all very sincere. And then we all kind of lose our minds in the second half. And I was looking at the one, and I, I, don't, this is, I don't want this to be the quoted part of this, but Ed Werder was held up in a Peter King column and he was showing Ed Werder's story and, and it's sucky for Ed Werder and I always liked Ed Werder and I read him as a kid in the Dallas Morning News. I but like these college students who were saying, well, if Ed Werder gets fired, gosh, or laid off, what do I do? I mean, Ed Werder just spent 17 years on television. Yeah, I mean, that to, to me, that's, and I, I hate the way it ended for him. I didn't want it to end for him, but that's a great success story in this business that we yeah. live in, right? Man, if you college kid, if you get 17 years on a giant television, network, you did great. Right. <laughs> you did great. That's a success. The young soccer columnist, the young big 12 guy that got laid off, that's tough. You know, that is a really tough one. And that's the one where you go, oh, you know, what am yeah. I, what do my prospects look like? And, and look, as you know, at the ringer here, we're, I think we have like 70 people that are working for us right now. And it's that number is going to keep going up. We're always looking for talent and I don't think we're alone. I, I think there's a bunch of different places, um, ranging from gigantic to medium to small that are always looking for people that are going to stand out and stand out in some way. Maybe, maybe their podcast stands out, maybe, um, Maybe the way they wrote a certain piece. Maybe they did a cameo somewhere. Like everyone's looking. So, yeah. for, so the, yeah, I mean, the whole the, thing the, of the sky, the sky is falling. Like there's not going to be jobs anymore. Like there's more content stuff out there than ever before. Twenty right. years ago, there are I, more people writing about sports than ever, ever, than ever, ever. I mean, they're just going to be fewer of the sort of, you know, God King type jobs that we've become accustomed to. Right. Well, I mean, when I was. Talking like, uh, I don't know, 1990, when I graduated grad school, 93, and I, and I wanted to get a job in Boston. It was like the Herald, the Globe, Boston, Phoenix, Boston Magazine. That was it. Right. I had four yeah. choices. Um, I, I do think people, people can stand out if they write something really good. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be found. 
You know, how many times have you seen on Twitter some piece from some website you've never heard of or blog you've never heard of and like, wow, that's pretty good. You know, every day. Um, so that that's a bonus. On the other hand, there's so many people trying to stand out that it becomes hard to stand out. Totally. And that's the flip side. And of it. it doesn't make it easy for anybody who just lost a job, right? No. And if you're the one who lost, just lost your job, you know, being told about how great the new world is yeah, that's, and all yeah. the opportunity, all the great opportunities you're going to have while you like your severance, uh, you know, ticks out of your bank account, that sucks, you yeah. know? And that's a, and, and if I understand the scenario uh, correctly, it's a tricky uh, setup for a lot of these folks who have extended contracts and that they have to make a choice at some point between, you know, either going to work for a new place and presumably almost surely taking less money or not working being put on the bench and and, and just collecting your your salary and that, that's a that's a tough one and we don't i mean we all think that this won't be the last round of layoffs for espn right because <sighs> they're also hiring people too it's not like yeah it's not yeah. like they're stripping across the board like they've made you know they did all these layoffs but then they also just bought the vertical sure yeah. If business, if if the two things that are hurting them keep going the way, which there's no reason they're not, right? People, are, they're going to have fewer subscribers. Yeah. Uh, sports rights fees, uh, let wake me when they go down. Maybe they will, but wake, <laughs> tap me on the shoulder when that yeah, happens. It's not happening. They're still going to be, they're going to have an economic problem. I mean, this is just the problem. It's going to be newspapers, right? You can staunch the bleeding and then you still have a problem. Well, and especially because you're you're, you're going to have new, more and more competition for those rights. I mean, you're going to yeah. have Amazon all of a sudden just jumping in and throwing money around, and then it's just a whole different dynamic. Amazon and what they've done with the Washington Post over these last couple of years has been the most fascinating media story for me. Because yeah. we three, four years ago, newspapers were dead. It was over. That was it. Let's have the funeral. The only one left is going to be the New York Times. Yeah. That was all stuff people were saying. And now we are in this different era where um, you could argue that Amazon's the future of everything, but especially like what they've done with newspapers is now a model that people are following. And the Wall Street Journal, which I always make fun of uh, Jason and Ben Cohen about that I can't read their some of their pieces sometimes without a subscription. But uh, but when did they go to the subscription model? Like what, four, four or five years ago? Well, there's always been a paywall to the Wall Street Journal since day one. Yeah, but is, I mean, this you know, the, whatever the new the model is, where you get some, you get some stuff. Yeah, I mean the sort of quote unquote leaky paywall. I think it's you know been tightened up uh, a few ratchets over the past couple of years. I mean, the idea of the way it works here is that if I put a link on Twitter or Facebook, anybody can read that, and you can make a referral of it too, which I think is actually a pretty good way of doing it, because yeah. you're not cutting yourself off from the world. No writer wants to be read by fewer people. I mean, it's just absurd. You know, it's an ego-driven business, let's face it, and so you want as many people reading it as possible, but yeah, you, something has to give in terms of the subscription model, and I agree with the Washington Post. I mean, it's a great story, but let's not forget there's sort of something at the core of it, which is they're spending. You know, they're spending. Yes. And same thing, you know, happened here at the journal uh, a handful of years ago in terms of just really making a reinvestment in journalism putting you know butts in chairs I mean that's a really really key thing it's awfully hard when you see a news organization you know lay off a bunch of people and sort of say you know we remain committed as, to journalism as ever I mean just it's just it, how can that possibly be a hundred percent true we uh, we never I trailed off with the Players Tribune thing that's a lot we can end on that the you were talking about the Dion Waiters being the highlight of the Players Tribune. We all grew up with tell all books that the guy didn't even write or look at. And the <laughs> author just wrote it. And now this is now a website. What's interesting is I don't I don't know anybody who's been to the Players Tribune homepage. When we were talking about like whether a homepage matters anymore, I think Players Tribune is an example of it's strictly gets sent to you, forwarded, you find it on on some blogs, you know, NBA Reddit or something, and that's how you know about the Dion Waiters thing. Is this a business? Because it seems like now we have, I I personally think this is one of the destinies for the undefeated. I think it eventually becomes ESPN's kind of version of the Players' Tribune. Some as told to kinds of things. Yeah, I'm gonna make a May 8, 2017 prediction. I think ESPN buys the Players' Tribune and combines it with the undefeated in the next 18 months. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And I think they try to own that corner which is a pretty smart corner to try to own if you're ESPN, right? You get the athlete relationships, 
you're controlling the narrative yeah. in a lot of ways, but I do think this is something. I don't know if it's a business for the Players Tribune because from what I've heard, so many players own stakes in the Players Tribune <laughs> that it's literally there's nothing left. But and let's uh, not forget, let's not forget the editor in chief, Derek Jeter. You know, he's probably going to be out of the newsroom quite yeah. a bit because he's got the Marlins deal. You know, Matt Harvey, the city editor, he's suspended right now. He might be around the newsroom a little bit more. Yeah. Um, Kevin Durant's I don't know. In the I, can, can you? <laughs> Can you go under the fold of ESPN and still be what the t- players should be? I mean, a lot of athletes have beef with ESPN, let's not forget. You know, I mean, I, I think part of what has made them them is that they've been able to go out and create these relationships with these guys because they have no institutional history. They don't have people feeling that they're burned, you know, potentially going to get burned or have been burned in the past by them. And that's how it's worked. Um, so I don't know. Is there any publication where the quality varies so wildly between articles? Other than the players' Japan. <laughs> I mean, all publications, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> we've talked about some of the great ones, but like Tiger Woods being mad at Dan Jenkins because Dan uh, Jenkins wrote oh, a yeah. fake interview with Tiger Woods as yeah. a column. <laughs> yeah. And he wrote that in the Players' Tribune. I mean, that was terrible. The Players' Tribune had a lot of misses. Yeah. Yeah. And there's stuff like, you know, David Ortiz writing about Dan Shaughnessy that's just kind of kind of weirdly interesting, but it's like one sentence in an otherwise like kind totally of fact like, checked, right? No. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I just that. like the titles. What is what is Durant what is, is Durant the um the executive editor? Yeah, he's the he's so, the Herald he's the I think they promoted Mr. Sean, him from, I think. No, he was the, managing editor for a while. I think they promoted him. <laughs> <laughs> The managing editor, I feel, should be more kind of like a, a workman-like player, like a utility infielder or something yeah. like that, because that's, that's an incredibly valuable newsroom job, and you, you, it's not really a star job, though. It's mm. kind of a glue guy, right? A magazine's glue guy. Yeah, exactly. He's the managing editor. So you, do, you don't think there's any growth in this, that it is what it is? Well, I, I think the growth is weird because it all depends on getting really good stuff. And do players, if you go to players, they say, well, I got a book deal, so I don't want to really do that. Or I got my own podcast thing, right? Yeah. I think the other thing we're going to see is the weirdness of the players to me was always that you could get all this under one roof as opposed to everybody just like Steph Curry. I'm just going to go start my own thing, right? Yeah. Or I'm going to do this all this through my Twitter account. I already got my own. I already got my own players to be. My question is, why do you even need the players to be in if you're anybody? Yeah. Why can't it's you so easy to just get get whatever you know i guess they have writers and editors that can craft the words a certain way but it seems like we're heading to a point where any athlete can just get their own message out however they want it whether it's on youtube facebook i don't know instagram oh, well, anything yeah, and, and and to be fair the counter to all this is oh well we're just complaining about the players tribune because it's rendering us irrelevant like why you know really reporters in the locker rooms to talk to anybody you know if these guys have their own channel now yeah, but I'd say the upside, if you're a player, is LeBron and Lee Jenkins, right? Why does LeBron go to Lee Jenkins to announce his thing? Because it's a better... Don't provoke me. Well, but it's a better... The upside is a better written thing than maybe LeBron's camp comes up with, right? Yes. Or there's a, it's rendered in such a way that makes people like LeBron instead of hate LeBron, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, that's part of it, you know? I mean, that's... that's it's old-fashioned. You know, print. I mean, it's print. I mean, that's that's the funny part of that relationship. And of course, you know, LeBron's history with live television is a little bit fraught. So print appears to be probably a better platform for him. LeBron, as long as he's had a couple swigs of champagne after a game seven, is a great interview. <laughs> <laughs> that's the key for LeBron. <laughs> uh, well, I went. I had a whole bunch of other stuff I wanted to talk about too, but we're out of time. That's it. Next we can time. talk about it another time. What, what's your next piece, on Brian? The, on the next episode of the Sports Reporters, <laughs> yeah. we will discuss what's your parting shot. <laughs> <laughs> we should have, we should have had parting shots. Oh my god, I would, I would have completely written one. Next time, we call this Sports Reporters 2.0. Maybe we make this like a <laughs> monthly thing. Parting shots would have been hilarious, but we, they would have had to have been delivered in the same kind of the way they do it in Minneapolis. In pious. Minneapolis this week. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then the, the, the chuckling before the joke. I always love it. Yeah. It's always <laughs> also good. the courtesy laugh from the other two panel, the other three panels. That was always nice. <laughs> I had, I also was going to surprise Jason with some PED stuff. Cause I know he, I know he's a huge cycling guy and has probably had more PED cycling thoughts than anybody, but we'll save that for to another be continued. time to be continued. Jason, thanks so much. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you were on this podcast finally. Yeah, thanks, man. All right, Brian Curtis, thank you. See you soon. I'll see you in the office. You got it. Uh, thanks to everybody out there. Ten years of uh, of podcasting for me. Um, hard to believe. I'll have to tell the story um, maybe on a different podcast about how this whole thing started and, and how it kind of evolved into what it evolved into. 
But thanks for listening. Thanks for spreading the word. We are back on Wednesday. Finally, Adam Carolla breaking down Fast 7 and Fast 8. It's been two years in the making, and uh, and we taped it. Tate, was it good? It was great. Tate loved it. Yeah. Cobra. That's coming. Yeah, it's coming. We, we, we There's probably a little too much Cobra in this podcast, but that's fine. But yeah, we're going to put that up Tuesday night late, so be ready for that one, uh, 9.01 p.m. Tuesday night. Take care. Thanks for listening to the BS Podcast.